Well, good morning, everybody. We're so thankful for your presence. We have a very nice uh, crowd with us, some visitors as well. Uh, even though we have several I know who are out of town and gone traveling and for other reasons, but we have uh, a great assembly with us this morning. And you just you sound you sound beautiful. I don't know if you can hear it back there, but from up here, you just sound spectacular. Uh, it wouldn't matter if you sounded terrible because it's the message that matters. It's the hymn, the words behind the hymns that we sing that matter, not the sound of it, not even the arrangement of the songs, whatever they may be, or the, the way that we harmonize when we harmonize or the melody or anything like that. It's just, that's just icing. That's just gravy. You know, it's, you don't want to mix those two, but if it's a cake, that's the icing. If it's, if it's potatoes, it's the gravy. Uh, whatever it is, it's the cherry on top that makes it, that what is already good, that much even better. Uh, so I know even if we sounded terrible, which we didn't, it would be great to hear from the heavenly vantage point. It's just great that we also sounded uh, so beautiful. Got a little, little bit of goosebumps right there, just listening to it. You're going to get used to that song. I bet you we're going to hear it again next week and the week after and the week after that because we are ushering in this morning a four-part series based around that song that we just sang, The Greatest Commands. Now let's start right there with the title because if, you, if your mind goes to the Bible when you hear certain words and phrases, especially of a biblical nature, then you might be reminded of the conversation that Jesus had with a man who approached him on one occasion and said, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Master, what is the great commandment, singular, in his mind, in the law? That person was clearly looking for the one above all. He was looking for the one over every other one. Don't give me the top five. Don't give me your best three. Give me the very single one was what that person wanted. Nobody's ever said, give me your top two anything. They want the top one. They want the one rising above all. And so Jesus, uh, at his behest, said, okay, I'll tell you, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then before the man walked away, he said, ah, just a second. And the second is like unto it. You should love your neighbor as you love yourself. My master had this idea that there is one great commandment. And that one great commandment has two aspects to it. Now that makes sense that he would think like that because he is the second person of God. He is one God. And he is one aspect of that one three-part nature of God. So of course his mind would go to one can have multiple parts. One can have multiple aspects. So what is the great commandment? It is that you love God with everything that you have. We'll talk about that in the fourth sermon in this series. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, or with all your might, your Bible might say. And the second is not a completely different commandment that I also think is really good, so I just want to mention it too. No. And the second commandment is related but not exactly the same. No, that's not what he says. The second is attached to it. The second is built alongside it. The second is done through the other one. How do I love God? Obviously, there's a lot of ways I do that. We've expressed many of them already in this worship. When we sing to God, we express our love to God. Even us singing about how God is love to us is an expression of our love to God. When we study God's Word, we recognize and we tell Him I want to dive into your mind. I want to communicate with you. I want to listen to you. I want a relationship with you. That's an expression of our love for him. But there is more than just that in terms of ways in which we express our love for God. I show God that I love him when I love you. And when I see this person who is in need and I help them, when I see this person who is vulgar and vile and from all worldly perspective, unlovable, and I love that person. That is me reflecting my love for God by loving that person. That person won't see that. What that person will see is this man really loves me. What God sees is that child of mine really loves me. Because I, I'll just be honest, if this person was vile and vulgar and hateful and what the word will call unlovable, I probably would not even think about helping that person. I would do what the world does, which is step over that person and go about my day. Something must compel me to stop and to help and to serve and to be that good Samaritan. What is it? It is a divine kind of love that I'm reflecting. The greatest command, singular, is that you love God. And you express that love, among other ways, through this other command, which is attached to it, that you love your neighbor as you love yourself 
who with yourself you love God, with all of yourself's heart, with all of yourself's soul, with all yourself's mind, with all yourself's might, and so on. Now how do we express that in song form? What is the great commandment in the law, Lord? Well, it is love one another. Just to flip them, put one before the other, because here's the order of the song. Verse one in the song, love one another. Now, that's John 15, verse 12. We're going to come back to the book of John in a minute. But that's the first verse of the song. We'll get all the rest of the words in a second. But that's how it begins. What's the great command? One, love one another. Also, the end of the song, love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. That's verse 1. That's verse 4. In between, you have the base part, which is what is love. How does one apply love? This is what we're going to talk about next week. Love bears all things, believes all things, endures all things, hopes all things. That's what love looks like. That's what people see when they see love. When I say that I love someone or I tell God that I love him, what does it look like in a physical world? This is how one expresses the idea of love, how I put it into practice, how I put it into application. And of course, there's that third verse, the tender part, which is just attached to the first verse. It's just, we, we take the very end of the first verse and us tenors, we just repeat it like a refrain over and over. We just hammer it, emphasize it, make it so that it's, it's ever present when you hear that song. God is love, 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 God is love. You'll hear that in the third sermon. But let's open our Bibles to the reading we just had. Look at your Bibles again in 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. Because first sermon, first verse. Second sermon, second verse, third verse, and so on. Third sermon, third verse. But first sermon this morning, verse number one of the song. And it's, this is not the exact quotation, at least not from the King James Version, but this is the uh, um, you know, hymnal version of the reading, First John 4, 7, and 8, the reading we just had, which is love one another for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And I say again, God is love. So let's break that down this morning. Again, go back to the reading. Love one another, for love is of God. But wait, I don't need the four yet. I don't need the four lovers of God yet. I can just stop with the first three words. Point one in your sermon, love one another. If the verse ended there, if the New Testament ended there, that would be all that I need. Those are my marching orders. That's my commandment. That's my go get it done statement. That's the imperative by the inspired apostle John, himself reflecting the words of Jesus, go love one another. That's what I'm supposed to do. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter what they haven't done, no matter what they've done to me personally, or to those that I love around me, no matter how guilty they may be, no matter how hard it may be to do, there is no qualification, there is no exception, it is just a blanket statement. Love one another. As many times as your Bible gives specifics and exceptions and, and, and um, um, particulars in the commandments of God, here's one that it just is what it is. It is the most broadly, easily applicable, I say easily, though it's not easily done, applicable commandment you've got. Love one another. Okay, who's that? That's anybody. That's why it says one another. What do I do? Love. That's why it says love. It's simple. And yet, if you dig into it, questions come. Because look at another verse. Look at John 13, 34. And listen to what my master said on the occasion of his last supper as he's leaving some final instructions with his disciples before he goes to have his passion and to die on the cross. Certainly related to that what is coming on his mind is this statement. And so he expresses it in this way. This is how he says it. To his disciples sitting around the table, he looks around the room and he says, this new commandment that I give you, that you love one another. Now hang on. Because I've read Leviticus 6, and I've read, well, there, there are scores of them in the Old Testament. I have read the old law of Moses, where Moses' law very specifically says to the Israelite nation that they are to, by commandment, love 
each other and take care of not just their fellow Israelites, but also the stranger at the gate, also the foreigner coming to, for help, also the people who are outside the same ones that in the same context of the law of Moses, they're by commandment told to separate themselves from, to be a holy separate nation, to be unique and distant from those pagans out there worshiping their little G gods. Don't associate with them, don't fraternize with them, get them out of the land, and yet when they need help, the law of Moses commanded them to help them because they're to love them. So what's Jesus playing at when he says, here's a new commandment that you love one another? All the people in that room loved each other already. But he didn't say love each other, you apostles. He says a new commandment in general, applied generally, is if you see anybody, make sure you love them. Okay, fine. But they've been hearing that, haven't been doing it, but they've been hearing that from the beginning of their life as a nation. So why does he call it a new commandment? A new commandment that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. There's something new about the way Jesus loved them and the world, which is everybody encompassed in the words all, one another. There's something about the way Jesus loved the world that inspired Jesus to say to them, this way that I am going to love and this way that I'm going to express that love is going to be something that you have the potential to emulate. Not to the extent, obviously, He's going to go to a cross. He's going to die for the sins of humanity. I'm not going to be able to do that. But the sacrificial nature of it, the willingness to die for someone else, especially when that someone else is evil, is wicked, is unloving, is unlovable, is your enemy. That's a new kind of love. That's something humanity had never seen before because Jesus was the first one ever to do that. And what's amazing about the sacrifice of Christ is that Jesus saw enough in what he was about to do that could be emulated. As I say, there are things you can't recreate in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But there was enough there that Jesus says, this is a thing that I'm going to do that I can leave as a template, that I can leave as an example, that I'm not just going to say, this is a great idea if you feel like it. I'm going to make this a foundational aspect of this new religion. You are a people who will love as I have loved you. And then he goes on to say later in the text, and you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. And in the same context, he says, greater love has no man than when a man lays down his life for his friends. What must I do for these people? I must love them. To what extent? To the point where I would lay down my life for them. But only my friends, right? Only the people who are kind to me and I'm kind to them, and we're buddy-buddy, and we have the same interests. No, that's not what friend means there. That a man lay down his life for his other. That a man lay down his life for his, his fellow. That a man lay down his life for a man, or for a woman, or for a child, or for a, just a person. There is no greater way to express that love than when you love as Jesus loved. Love one another, this new commandment I give you. Now, we could stop right there. I could give you the invitation. I've given you the marching orders. It's my job as the preacher to tell you, here's what the book says, now go do it. But that's not all the book says. This is one of those rare occasions when God, the ultimate parent, gives the rule, gives the commandment, and doesn't just say, because I said so. You get that all over the place in the Bible. But here's one of those rare bird times when God doesn't just say, love, don't ask me questions because I said so, that's why. He doesn't do that. He tells you the why. Why should I love one another? What's the thought process? What went into the mind of God that made him come to the conclusion, therefore, you people should love each other? What was going on in God's mind? What led to this commandment? Why should I love? Look at that guy over there. Why should I love him? Look at what this person has done to me. Why should I love them? Look at what I have done to them. Why should they love me? What's the reason? I'll tell you. Mind you, John's writing to Christians. We'll get that in the next point. But here, here's the why. Why should I love one another? It's because for love is of God. Not, the reason is not God is love. We'll get that later. The reason is, love is of God. 
In the original language, love is ek, E-K, out of. Love came from God. Why should I love you? Why should you love me when I keep giving you reasons not to? Your motivation for loving me is not me. I'm giving you no reason to love me. I'm giving you reason to hate me. What's overcoming the, the reasons I'm giving you to hate me is the fact that you are a child of God. That's the next point. And your Father in heaven created love. And you want to be like him, don't you? Don't children want to be like their parents? You want to be like your, your Father in heaven? God made love. I don't know if we've appreciated that enough. I think I said this just an offhand comment in a sermon like a year or so ago, but you guys forget what we preach after like two weeks, so it doesn't matter. I can repeat myself. Listen to what John says here and appreciate what he is actually telling you. Love is not just this thing that has always been. Love is not this, this, this um, you know, concept that has always existed. God made love. God has always existed. Yes, I know God is love, but that's semantics. We'll get that later. God has always existed. And God gave us love. God produced and provided love. The very first time you loved somebody was the very first time you loved somebody. But it was not the first time love ever happened. The very first time, go all the way back to the beginning. The very first time that Adam loved someone. It's probably Eve. He laid eyes on her. It was love at first sight. But that was not the first time love had ever happened. Your Bible tells you in Ephesians 3.11 that from the before the beginning, that from the before the beginning, God had a plan in mind to save humanity. God had an idea in his mind that he would make man, that man would sin against him, that man, through our rebellion to God, would make ourselves unlovable, that we would spit in his face, that we would blaspheme his name, that we would worship his creation and not him the creator. That we would mock everything that is righteous and good and wonderful about God. That we would have nothing to do with God and just want nothing to do with Him ever again. And God, knowing that in His mind, said to Himself, I still want to make these people. I still want a relationship with these people. I still want to save these people. Listen to that last one. God had in His mind the idea. He said to Himself, I, despite all that, I still want to save these people from the punishment of the crime of their hating me. And he took all those ideas, he took all those I wants, and he gave it a name. And he says, I'm going to call all of that love. And I'm going to show them what that love looks like. Because it's not just an emotion, it's not just a thought, it's an action, it's something you put into practice. And I'm going to offer my son to die for them, to save them from the punishment for the crime of hating me. What are you, you going to call that? I'm going to call that love. Love one another as I have loved you. Love one another because love came from God. Look at 1 John 4.10. I want to read the text. I've been talking and talking, but let me read the Bible for you. Look at 1 John 4, verse number 10. Herein is love, John writes. Not that we love God. We didn't come up with this idea but that he loved us and he gave his son to be the King James says propitiation, sin offering for us. How do we know what love is? Well, how do we know what God is? What did Jesus himself say? You've never seen the Father. John said it in his book. You've never seen the Father. The only begotten of the Father has declared him. How do I know who God is? The Son declares him. How do I know what love is? If love is God, we'll get to later. If God is love, how do I know what God the unseeable is? How do I know what love is? If God is love, then love is unseeable. No, God gave his son to show who he is. God gave his son to be a propitiation. God gave his son to be a sin offering. God gave his son to die. What is love? It is the willingness to die for someone else. So that, that's the extreme. That's the ultimate. If you hit that mark, everything else is love as well that you do in the service to another. Love one another. Why? For love is of God. Now let's get to the how. Because how am I supposed to pull that off? Because I can barely love myself sometimes. How am I supposed to love all you people? No, I mean, I mean, how are you supposed to love me? It's, yeah, but I, I know you're having a hard enough time sometimes loving yourselves. I gotta love everybody else too. How? He who loves knows God. 
and is born of God. And the opposite is true as well. Therefore, if you don't love, you don't know God, and you're not born of God. In other words, don't worry about the how am I going to figure out how to do this because it is built into your being a Christian. It is baked into the thing that you did when you became a Christian. You became born of God. And through your reenactment of his death, burial, and resurrection, you started a new life. Think about why it is hard for you sometimes to love someone else. Sometimes it's because of your own baggage. Sometimes it's because of theirs. Sometimes you've got so much on your plate that you can't find yourself extending an arm to someone else. Sometimes they've done so much to you that you find it difficult to reach out to them. When you become a Christian, all of your baggage is gone. And when you become a Christian, you appreciate the saving power of Jesus to take all their baggage away as well. It's, just, it's double helpful if that one you're trying to love is also a Christian. Because then you can stop and think, all that that they're doing to me, all that baggage, all that sin, if they repent of it, is washed away, taken away, removed. So it isn't a separation anymore. It isn't an obstacle to overcome. We're already linked. We're already one. And if they're not a Christian, all their baggage is irrelevant. Because when Jesus died to save me, I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't lovable. I wasn't good and kind and righteous. I was unworthy, and he came. Remember what Paul says in Romans 5. When we were yet without sin, when yet still in our sins, Christ died for the ungodly. Listen. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet on occasion for a good man, someone might dare to die. Can an atheist love someone? Yes. Can an atheist sacrifice himself for someone? Yes. Can you find an example, rare though they be, for someone being willing to jump in front of a bullet for someone else? Just a split second, got to think, got no time to think, got to act decision. Yes, you can find them. It doesn't matter if they're the most Satan-loving atheist or the most Christ-loving Christian. It doesn't matter. You can find someone willing to jump, split second decision, uh, in front of a bullet for someone else. Can you find someone willing to wait in a long line where you're just standing slowly, contemplating how at the end of this eventual line you're going to have to be murdered for someone else rarely will you find someone willing but maybe if you look far enough and hard enough you can find somebody who is willing to wait in an excruciatingly long line where all they have to do to pass the time is to think how at the end of this line i'm going to die for that other person can you find someone willing to do that i'll concede the maybe but that is not what jesus did for you what Jesus did for you was he came, first of all, he had all of eternity beforehand to, con to consider this. And then he came, and for 33 years he started a line. He started walking in it, at the end of which was the cross. And he's in this line, and he's walking. He doesn't have a cell phone to kill time with. He doesn't have people to talk to to make the line go faster. He's just waiting. All he has is his thoughts. And if you don't believe that, forget the, last, the, the only 33 years of his life. Just consider the last 33 hours of his life how many comments and thoughts and prayers he made about the cross that is now before him. It was on his mind. But Jesus, here's the thing that makes him so unique. As he is in that line, being willing to go and die for humanity, humanity is outside of that line, laughing at him, walking alongside him, mocking him, spitting on him, telling him, you deserve this. You should get better than me. You're the sinner, not me. And at any point in that process, upon hearing that slander and that hatred, my master could have just said, you know what, forget this. I don't need to be in this line. I'm not a sinner. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm innocent. I'm going back to my Father in heaven, and I'm going to send 12 legions of angels to blow up the earth. He could have done that like that. But he didn't. He went through that line, knowing it would end in his death for the very people who were mocking him for being in the line. God, to finish Paul's quote in Romans 5, God sent Jesus when we were yet in our sins. In due time, Christ died for us. When we were unworthy of it, when we did not deserve it even a little bit, when we were completely gone away from him, he went and died for us. And that example, that template of his death, his sacrificial death, his burial and resurrection is reenacted when I become a Christian, which means it's more than just about me saving me. It is initiating myself into a movement where I get to obey the great commandment to go help other people. 
and to go die for other people if it comes to it and to go love other people. I mean, that's what it means. Sacrificial love is death, uh, love to the point where if I have to die for them, I will die for them. Jesus had to, so he did. I may never have to die for any of you people, but I better love you enough that if the moment comes, I'm ready. I'm prepared. And listen, it'd be a lot easier to die for you than it would be someone out there who hates me, who mocks me, who spits in my face. And yet, love one another, Jesus says, as I have loved you people when you were spitting in my face and mocking me. How can I possibly love other people? Well, it's really hard not to try. And I look at what my master did for me. Which takes us to the last point. John says, again, he who does not love does not know God. This is the who of the commandment. We got the what, love one another. We have the why, for lovers of God. We have the how, because I've been born of God. Who, this is just to reiterate the first point. Who am I supposed to love? Because when I listen to point two, and I listen to point three, how love is of God and what God did for me through his love, it's really easy for me to love God. I didn't love him before, back when he was dying for me, but now that he's died for me and I've reenacted it and I am on his side, it's really easy to love God. Anybody find it difficult to love Jesus? Nope, it's really easy, because look what he did for you. But John is not telling you to love Jesus. He understands you've already done that. John is telling you the difficult one. He's telling you to love one another. And if you don't love one another, don't say you love God. Don't say you know God. Don't say you're born of God. Because if you don't love one another, you don't know God. That's the who that we can't forget in this commandment. It is so easy to sing this song that we just sang a minute ago. And we'll sing again next week, I'm sure, and the week after, and the week after. It is so easy to sing that song and end it thinking, oh, I just love God so much. I can't wait to go to heaven and sing it all over again. That song is a marching order for you to love one another, to love each other, because love bears all things. You're not bearing, you're not putting up with God. You're believing each other, trusting each other. You're not enduring with God, you're enduring with each other. I'm stepping on on my toes for next week, but that's the, that's the idea that he's giving you here. This is not about how easy it is to love God. Isn't it swell that we get to love God? It's how hard is it to love each other. But look at what God did for each other, and I must do like he did. Love one another, for God is love. God loved you. So must I. Now, are you here this morning and not a Christian? Are you here this morning and not a child of God? Guess what? You don't deserve to be saved. But neither did I, and I get to be saved. You don't deserve to be loved by the infinitely loving Almighty God, and yet He created it just so He could. What you deserve, non-Christian, is to face the fiery judgment and punishment of God for all of your sins and crimes against Him. And that is a part of his very nature. He is a just judge. He weighs in the balances. He determines good and bad. And he punishes the bad. But we've all done bad, Romans 3.23. We should all be destroyed. We should all be judged, found guilty, and condemned. And so he said, how do we balance the scales? I'll create love. And through love, I'll give you what you don't deserve. That's grace. I'll give you what you don't deserve. Mercy's not getting what you do deserve. Grace is not getting... Grace is getting what you don't deserve. You're not just getting not destroyed. You're getting saved. So why you would not take advantage of that, I don't understand. Because he loved you enough to provide the way for you to be saved. So become a Christian this morning. Believe Jesus when he tells you, I'm here to save you. Repent to Jesus. Turn your life around back to Jesus. Confess your faith in Jesus. Go tell other people about Jesus. Be baptized into Jesus. Reenact his death, burial, resurrection for you. Live faithfully for Jesus. You're not going to be perfect, but go do your best loving one another. And then when Jesus comes back, he'll come back for you. And you can live with Jesus forever and ever. Do you need to become a Christian? Do you need to be restored? Now is your opportunity. Please come right now as we stand and sing.